I analyzed 159 journal rejections, high impact journals covering social sciences, natural sciences, and the health and medical fields. In this video, I'm gonna share with you what I learned. But before I do, a few caveats. Um, one, if you're not getting rejected, you're probably not aiming high enough. You can imagine at one extreme of peer review, there are predatory journals where you're virtually guaranteed acceptance if you're willing to pay. On the other end of the spectrum though, you have high impact journals where I've published a number of papers like the prestigious medical journal, The Lancet, where acceptance rates can be between one and 2%. I mean, odds are statistically, if you're just producing an average paper in the field, you are going to get rejected. So rejection is not something that should put you down or leave you feeling, you know, like you should just quit and give up and throw in the towel, but it's a normal, healthy sign of progress. I'm Professor David Stuckler, and I've published over 400 papers in peer-reviewed journals, but I've had my fair share of bumps along the way and plenty of rejections. In this video, I'm gonna analyze those rejections deeply and pull out the five most common themes and trends that I've seen in them so that you can learn and also you too can optimize your chances for success. So let's dive straight in. So first, desk rejection, the most common rejection that you're gonna face and probably the most infuriating one because what you simply get back from the journal is no second chance and no data on how to improve. As in this example here, we regret to inform you that we will not be processing your submission further. Submissions sent for peer review are selected based on novelty and general significance in addition to the whatever this means, usual criteria for publication in scholarly journals. Therefore, our decision does not necessarily reflect the quality of your work. This is infuriating because you don't know what went wrong. And the typical responses are two. Um, one is what I call a sin of commission, not a sin of omission where you left something out, but a feeling the need that you need to do a radical surgery to the paper to fix it up and make it better. This is the wrong approach because you're acting blindly. You don't know if you're improving it or making it worse. What you really need to do in this case is get feedback from somebody in your field who can give you the reactions, the data that you need to improve your chances for success. But the second main approach is simply just plow ahead. Rejection is normal, and if you're not getting rejected, you're just not aiming high enough. So accept that as part of the process, line up about five papers on your hit list so that when you get a rejection, and you will, um, you will be ready to go, locked and loaded, and very quickly move on to the next journal. If you're struggling to publish or just want feedback on your paper, click the link below to connect with me and let's see if you're a good fit for a fast track inner circle program. Over 93% of our students publish successfully using our system and methods. And yes, we do offer a publication guarantee. That is you show up, we stick with you until your paper is accepted. The second thing that we learn from journals as a major source of rejection is the lack of novelty critique. Your paper does not make a sufficient enough original contribution to the field to merit publication in this journal. We wish you luck elsewhere. This is incredibly common and it can mean one of two things. Um, one is it can simply be, again, you've aimed high and the reviewers or the editors just don't think that your contribution here is strong enough to merit publication in the prestigious journal of nature that can only accept the top contributions from scholars all over the sciences, all across fields. And that's just gonna happen because limited space and they have a lot of demand. But the second thing that can also commonly happen and is perhaps more infuriating is you might not have articulated very well your gap and your value add and the novelty of your research. And this is really important. You need to set this up in the cover letter to make very simple and accessible to your editors. What did you find to have a find a simple message that the editors of those journals can see, yeah, immediately, this is important. So that doesn't mean going into methodological brambles, all the nuance that you might wanna do. No, you need to very simply, succinctly make the editor aware why this is so important. What is your value add and what is new about what you've done? And don't be shy in your cover letter about using bold language. You might wanna to tone things down a little bit in your actual manuscript, but don't shy away from being bold in your cover letter. And if you want some tips on how to submit like a pro to a journal, check out this video right here, which is gonna share some of our insider secrets. Just on novelty, this is also why with the researchers whom we work with, it's incredibly important to map out your topic at the beginning. I would say about 90% of success comes to choosing a winning topic, a topic that you can deliver on that is going to get picked up by top journals. I mean, what a shame it is to have a topic, dedicate years of your life potentially, only to have it be dead on arrival because the potential to contribute is marginal 
or very, very small. You really want to use your power to choose winning topics before you dive in and burn all that time and energy, which can be an incredible loss. And you really can't do that much to fix later. Third big reason or big theme that we saw in all these rejections is the methods. And again, this is taking one of two flavors. The most frustrating of these is that the reviewer says you didn't do something that you actually did. And at the beginning, early in my career, I could see when this was happening, and this was more frequent early, I realized that it was like, oh, the reviewers are so dumb. I actually did that. And I was just thinking, oh, I just got unlucky with the reviewers. But as it turns out, as I look more critically, I realized I need to make my methods clearer, more linear, and write it like I'm baking a cake, that somebody else can bake the cake and follow the recipe that I did to get the same results. So I have started taking the assumption that my reviewers are just dumb, and to write the methods without dumbing it down, but to write it in as simple and linear a way as possible. And that really started to help me avoid this kind of rejection. The other thing that can happen is there may be some real methodological weakness in your paper. You need to address it. So there are multiple ways to address it. One is to actually, you may need to go back and add in a robustness check or do an extra experiment. That's one good way. Another way might be to anticipate and get in front of this comment. So in your limitations section of your discussion, this is actually the place to be transparent about your weaknesses. Because what that's doing is like taking a big shield and armoring yourself up. So the reviewers are like, well, this, this professor is really dumb. He didn't think of this. And you're like, hey! a second. No, no, no. Go to the discussion section. I have it right there. I actually thought about that. And this is how I addressed this methodological weakness in the best possible way. So there are some really good strategies that can help reinforce your paper and avoid this potential limitation. And if you're interested in that, check out our academic writing paper template that goes through a step-by-step -step outline of what the discussion paper part of your paper needs to include so you can optimize your chances for success. I've got the link right here below. One final note here on the methods. When you resubmit your paper, if it did get rejected because of a methodological critique, sometimes the temptation is to just resubmit it. But in this case, I would argue no. You are very likely to get similar reviewers. This has happened to us many, many times because the editors are following the same kind of algorithm of looking at your paper to find the peer reviewers whom they want to invite. And if they send the paper that you've submitted to another journal to the same reviewers, those reviewers won't even look at it and they'll just be like, ah, well, same problem is here, reject. So to give yourself a fair shake and the best chances, you do need to go as far as possible while doing the minimum to thoroughly address those reviewers' critiques. Fourth major reason is that you didn't show enough knowledge or citation of existing literature. This one can feel really infuriating. The worst flavor I've had of this is when somebody said I didn't cite a paper. That was actually one of my own papers that I had co-authored. But look, this can happen for multiple reasons. One, it can be there are big egos in the field. Someone who's published a lot wants to get their paper cited and they're not going to self-cite. They want you to do it. The other, it can be the ego that maybe you were really harshly critical about that author's work in the introduction, saying, ah, this terrible work that came before. And maybe you didn't put it that bluntly, but that person, if he's a, or she is a reviewer, they're gonna have an incentive to keep you out. And so, uh, I mean, I definitely have seen the form or flavor where I get a comment, well, these authors don't show an, sufficient knowledge of the existing literature and they need to cite paper one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you go look at those sevens and they all have one author in common. When I've seen this happen, not just once, but multiple times as a recurring theme, you do realize that the simple fix here is just to cite broadly and liberally in your introduction, you can't go wrong by adding too many citations uh, to reinforce these points and make sure you're stroking some of the egos in your field along the way because the editors are looking in the introduction to find potential reviewers for your papers. So it is very likely to go to them. Final reason that we found, and again, this one started to disappear later in my career, um, and this is that the reviewers lost confidence at a revision stage in your ability to take on board their critiques and implement them. So the answer from a reviewer would come back to the editor and say, uh, no, they haven't sufficiently addressed my concerns, and the editor loses confidence in you and rejects you. And this is painful because by now, your paper's gone through submission, you've edited it, and it's gone to a revision. 
you could be nine months, maybe a year in from the time of submission, delaying your paper, your data are getting old, it's out of date, you may be scooped by somebody else. So this can really be a disaster. And that's why we've developed our two-step revision method that's enabled me personally to get an over 97% success rate on revisions. And in, in our fast track research, inner circle and collective, we consider revision a win because we are so successful about getting this through. So if you wanna check this out, we've got our revision template that's gonna share with you our two-step method. You can actually find it right here. Um, check it out, you're gonna love it, and this is gonna boost your chances of getting a revision through to the finish line to acceptance massively so that you too will start feeling like we do, that revision is already a win. Listen, if you felt that painful sting of journal rejection, again, remember, you're not alone, but there is a better way. Really encourage you to check out some of the resources we have pinned to the link below. Get in touch with me in the DMs. Let's see if we're a good fit to potentially work together and optimize your chances for publishing success. I'll see you guys in the next video.